One of the many things that makes Star Trek Deep Space Nine the most interesting corner of the Star Trek franchise is how unreservedly it embraces moral ambiguity in its characters, the situations in which they find themselves, and the choices they make. In Classic Trek and Next Gen, it's never really in question whether Captain Kirk, Captain Picard, their crews, and the organizations they represent, Starfleet and the Federation, are the good guys. Of course Starfleet are the good guys. Then along comes DS9, like... are they? What if Starfleet and the Federation aren't the unblemished beacons of virtue, tolerance, and justice they were presented as during the first 25 years or so of Star Trek? What if the heroes aren't always so heroic, especially from the perspective of people affected by the consequences of their actions? And what if one of the captain's arch-nemeses isn't the villain after all? Those are all excellent questions, and they lead me to ask one more. Is Michael Eddington actually the hero of Deep Space Nine? But before we can answer that question, let's take a look at one a little more basic. I bet some of you are asking, who's Michael Eddington? Actually, I take that back. If you're watching this video, you almost certainly know who Michael Eddington is already, but I'm going to introduce him anyway, just to make sure we're all on the same page and also to give myself space to make more of the hilarious and insightful jokes for which I am known and beloved throughout the minuscule sliver of the Star Trek fandom that knows who the hell I am. So, Michael Eddington first joined the crew of Deep Space Nine and, hold on, no, that's, see, this is what I mean by making sure we're all on the same page. This is not Eddington, this is Lieutenant Primen. He comes aboard the station for a couple of episodes in Season 1. Colomini temporarily left the show to shoot a movie, and the producers needed someone to take Chief O'Brien's lines. So in popped Primen! Then, after two episodes, O'Brien returned, and Primen vanished, his name to be spoken no more forever. Like Eddington, Primmons, a Starfleet security officer, and like Eddington, Primmons' presence aboard the station causes Odo to throw a tantrum and threaten to quit, but Primmons is actually a totally different guy than Eddington. You can tell them apart pretty easily because Primmons looks like a human and Eddington looks just like a rat, which is what he is. Or is he? Because maybe he's not. Lieutenant Commander Michael Eddington first appears in the third season premiere of Deep Space Nine, The Search, Part 1, where his presence is explained as being at the insistence of Starfleet, which wants a more robust security presence on the station after the Dominion becomes a threat. At first, Eddington seems like a good dude. In fact, for the majority of his nine appearances in the series, he is, apparently, a loyal member of Captain Sisko's crew. There's tension with Odo, as I alluded to earlier, because Odo wants to be in total control of station security and feels like having Eddington around undermines his authority, but other than that, he seems to get along with everyone. And anyway, the tension with Odo is a good thing, dramatically speaking, because Odo is usually so gruff and intimidating, and it's nice to see that beneath that tough guy veneer, he's just a big titty baby. Eddington helps out on the mission to find the Founders in the two-parter The Search. He's aboard the Defiant during the mission to stop a secret joint Cardassian and Romulan fleet from destroying the Founders. Now, there he does commit an act of sabotage, but he does it on the orders of a Starfleet Admiral. And once he explains the situation to Sisko, he's allowed to resume his duties. He's also one of the only senior officers not trapped in the hollow suite during the events of Our Man Bashir, and he helps Odo, Quark, and Rom save everybody who is trapped inside. So, however you feel about what he does next, it's not like the guy is pure evil. He would probably be remembered today as an adequate but unremarkable recurring character who popped up in a few episodes, kissed a little ass, occasionally got to do some important stuff, and was mostly just kind of fine. Like O'Brien in TNG. But then we come to For the Cause, from late in Deep Space Nine's fourth season, when all of that changes. In this episode, Eddington reveals that he is a member of the Maquis 
and betrays Starfleet to steal a set of industrial replicators that are intended to help Cardassia rebuild following recent attacks from the Klingons. After he's made off with the replicators, he contacts Sisko to say, hey, maybe just leave us alone? All we did to the Federation was leave it, which I know really bothers you because everybody's supposed to want to join the Federation, but the Maquis is at war with the Cardassians, so if the Federation doesn't bother us, we won't bother you. Also, you're worse than the Borg. Sisko's like, I'm pretty sure you know my wife was killed by the Borg, so that feels like a cheap shot. Oh shit, I wasn't even thinking about that. Dude, I am so sorry. I did Yeah, 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 look, it's pretty simple. You betrayed Starfleet, and you betrayed me. And for that, I will hunt you down and see you pay for your crimes, even if it takes the rest of my goddamn life. As long as you are free, this will never be over. So, anyway, I'm gonna go. No hard feelings about the Bork thing, though, right? Click. I guess maybe Eddington was hoping Sisko would just forget about the whole betrayed his uniform thing. But he doesn't. He really doesn't. Sisko stays on the hunt for Eddington, and he finally catches up to him about halfway through Season 5 of Deep Space Nine, in an episode entitled, For the Uniform. Sisko visits a Maquis colony, where he's supposed to meet an informant with info on Eddington's whereabouts. Instead, he finds Eddington himself, who holds Sisko at bay with a weapon and explains, We found out about your informant and marooned him on a planet in the middle of the Badlands, because here in the Maquis, we don't take kindly to traitors. Funny, we don't like him in Starfleet either. Okay, I get the point you're making, but what I did to you was totally different. I turned my back on Starfleet to fight for people like the ones who live here. Refugees. Victims of the Federation. Sisko's like, really? Because... I see it differently. I think these people are victims of the Maquis, because you've been telling them that someday they'll be able to return to the homes they were forced to leave, which you know is bullshit. Funny you should bring that up. Refresh my memory. Who forced them to leave their homes? Was it the Federation? When it signed that treaty that gave their planets to the Cardassians? Without asking them first? Because that's how I remember it. Shut up. No, you shut up. I told you to shut up first! Look, I'm leaving. I just wanted to tell you to stop chasing me, because if you don't, you'll regret it. Bye. You shut up. Sisko beams aboard the Defiant and pursues Eddington's ship into the Badlands, but a virus Eddington secretly planted aboard the Defiant before he left Starfleet disables the ship. Eddington calls Sisko on the hollow communicator and says, Seriously, dude, this isn't personal for me. I could destroy the Defiant, but I'm not gonna. I'm not a killer. Just let it go. Sisko does not let it go. The Defiant is towed back to Deep Space Nine, and soon after comes word that Starfleet has assigned another captain to take over the search for Eddington. You're too close to this one, Sisko. You're off the case. Only, it's the other captain, Sanders, commanding officer of the USS Malinche who gives him the news, and he's not a jerk about it like that. He seems cool. Sanders returns to the Malinche and warps off to look for Eddington. Meanwhile, Sisko goes to the Hollow Suite and does some work on the heavy bag, and by work, I mean he kind of has a breakdown over being taken off the search for Eddington and how he wasn't able to see Eddington for what he was, and just the whole Eddington thing. Can't say I blame him. Eddington's betrayal happened under Sisko's watch. We get the impression that Sisko didn't choose Eddington for the job himself. Eddington was assigned to Deep Space Nine over Sisko's objections, but there would presumably have been no need to assign Eddington to head up the station's Starfleet security detail if Primmon was still around. Primmon would never join the Maquis. He was a good boy. What happened to him? He took over O'Brien's role in the show, but he didn't take O'Brien's job on the station. He was security, O'Brien's chief of operations. There's no reason Primmon couldn't have stuck around after O'Brien got back, unless Odo got fed up and had him killed. It's not inconceivable. Odo's gearing up for some big security operation, hoping to catch Quark red-handed doing some crimes in Cargo Bay 4, but when he gets there, he finds that Primmon 
and his Starfleet security team have already found and seized Quark's contraband. Odo's like, uh. A few hours later, Odo's standing on the upper level of the promenade and Primen floats by one of the viewports. Odo acts like he doesn't notice, but once Primen's frozen corpse is out of sight, he's like, huh, and walks away with that smirk on his face. Anyway, Dax is there in the hollow suite with Cisco too, and she's like, hey, Eddington's not your problem anymore. Then Kira calls him and says, Eddington's your problem again. What she actually says is that the Maquis has created biogenic weapons from materials they stole from some Bolian freighters and have just used one of the weapons to poison a Cardassian colony in the demilitarized zone. The poison in the weapon renders the planet uninhabitable to Cardassians, but is harmless to most other humanoids. The Maquis is like, we keep it now. The Maquis have the supplies to make enough biogenic weapons to poison every Cardassian planet in the DMZ. The Malinche is already too far away to stop the Maquis from striking again, and there are no other Starfleet vessels in the area, so Sisko decides to take the Defiant back out. Unfortunately, the Defiant is still well beat the hell up after that virus Eddington planted, so in order to get it running, the crew has to improvise. They have no transporters, they have no cloaking device, they have no automatic weapons targeting, they can only go warp six, and they have no internal communications. So Nog has to stand there and holler instructions to the engine room through an earpiece. Are we sure the Defiant is the only ship in range? The Maquis have been a concern for like two years. There's a wormhole right over there. You can probably throw a rock and hit Cardassia Prime from here. Why are there no other Starfleet ships around? There are never any ships near Earth whenever there's a crisis there either. Which is why whichever ship the protagonists are on always has to handle whatever it is. Where do all the ships go? What is so important? They almost crash into the station as they're pulling out of their parking space, but the Defiant gets underway. They chase down a Maquis signal in the Badlands, but it turns out it's just a decoy. The only thing waiting for them is a message from Eddington, who's like, Ha ha, I'm not actually here. But here's a consolation prize, a copy of one of my favorite books, Les Miserables. You've probably heard of it, it's considered a classic, was adapted into a few great films, and an absolutely insufferable musical. Sisko's like, I've read it. And Eddington tells him, well, read it again, because you're totally a Javert. Sisko's like, great, instead of catching Eddington, I've got homework. This day can't get any worse. Then they get a distress call from the Malinche. While the Defiant was in the Badlands on a wild goose chase, the Maquis attacked and disabled the Malinche. But on the bright side, during the fight, the Malinche intercepted a coded message being sent by the Maquis. Captain Sanders sends the message to Sisko, who in turn sends it back to Deep Space Nine to see if Odo can decode it since the Defiant's computers are still only able to run in safe mode. After analyzing the message, Odo figures out that the Maquis are probably working some kind of deal with the Breen in order to store the components of their bioweapon. Sisko has Worf check sensor logs for Starfleet intelligence drones at the nearest Breen colony, and they discover a Maquis ship has recently been there. Given the size and speed of the Maquis ship, plus the relative defenses of nearby potential targets, Dax and Worf guess that Eddington's next attack will be against one of two Cardassian colonies in the DMZ, Quetal or Panora. Sisko guesses it'll be Quetal, so they head on over there, but they get there too late. The Maquis have already attacked the planet and poisoned its atmosphere. The Cardassian colonists are evacuating. Kira spots some Maquis ships still in the area, on one of which is Eddington, but he gets away after disabling one of the Cardassian transport ships, forcing the Defiant to stay behind and help them. Later, Sisko is reading Les Miserables when Dax walks in and says, Hey, do you need someone to talk at and feed you prompting questions while you work out what you're going to do in the final act? Sisko's like, Yeah, please, have a seat. With Dax playing Watson, Sisko reasons that Eddington views himself as Jean Valjean, the hero of Les Miserables, the man being unfairly persecuted by an overbearing and obsessive authority figure. And since Eddington sees himself as the hero, 
Cisco figures he can defeat Eddington by embracing his own role in Eddington's story as the villain. Cisco returns to the bridge and tells Worf to prepare a couple of torpedoes with an extra payload of trilithium. Then he orders Dax to set course for the nearest Maquis colony. Then he broadcasts a message to the Maquis announcing that in one hour he is going to attack that nearby Maquis colony with a trilithium weapon that will render the planet uninhabitable to humans so they'd better start evacuating. The hour goes by, the Defiant is standing by above the planet, there's no Maquis activity, there's no evacuation. Finally, with a minute to go until Cisco's deadline, they get a hollow zoom from Eddington. He's like, you know I'm calling this bluff, right? Do you really expect me to believe that you, a decorated Starfleet officer, is going to poison the atmosphere of a planet? Cisco's like, yeah, because that's what I'm going to do. Worf, fire the torpedoes. And Worf's like, um, what? You know you're getting dangerously close to a moral event horizon when you give Worf an order to fire torpedoes, and he's like, are you sure about this, boss? But Cisco says, fire the torpedoes! And Worf's like, well, he said it twice, so I guess it's okay, and fires the torpedoes, and Eddington is like, what? Cisco says, how do you like that? And I'm not done. I'm going to poison every Maquis colony in the DMZ, because guess what? When the Maquis attacked the Malinche, a Starfleet vessel, you became a direct threat to the Federation, so I'm taking you out. You can't do that. What about the innocent people in those Maquis colonies? You shut up. You're forsaking your core values just to satisfy a personal vendetta against me. You betrayed your uniform! Actually, I can't do it justice. I'm going to need the real clip for this one. You betrayed your uniform! Oh, yeah. So Eddington's like, actually, can I get another one? You betrayed your uniform! You betrayed your uniform! Okay, I think I'm ready to continue. Cisco threatens to hang up on Eddington and go poison another Maquis planet, but Eddington's like, wait, if you stop the poisoning spree, I'll turn over all my bioweapons. Cisco's like, mm, that's not going to do it, homie. So Eddington says, fine, I'll turn myself in. You get what you want, Javert. They call me Mr. Javert. And that's pretty much it. It turns out the poison Cisco used only affects humans, and remember, the poison the Maquis used only affects Cardassians, so the colonists who had to evacuate will just switch planets and everybody's happy. Isn't forcing people who didn't want to move to switch planets what started this whole Maquis thing to begin with? Whatever. Eddington is in custody, and Dax <laughs> does not seem bothered at all by the moral implications of what Cisco did in order to catch him. She just took part in a mission where they poisoned the planet and forced a mass evacuation of civilians in order to capture one guy. And her final statement on the matter is, sometimes I like it when the bad guy wins. I mean, one of her past hosts was a murderer, so that kind of tracks. Just because Dax has no problem whatsoever with what Cisco does to catch Eddington, that doesn't mean we shouldn't. One of the things that makes For the Uniform such a good episode, and it's one of my favorite Deep Space Nine episodes, is that it invites us to consider questions like, does Cisco go too far because of his personal feelings toward Eddington? And is what Eddington's done really that bad? The episode makes it pretty clear that Cisco is extremely emotionally compromised when it comes to Eddington. He breaks down while hitting the heavy bag after Starfleet takes him off the case. And remember what he says, I worked with him every day and I didn't see it. He's not a changeling, he's not a wormhole alien, he's just a man, and he beat me. Eddington, on the other hand, genuinely doesn't seem to take the conflict with Cisco personally. He seems a little full of himself, what with the you're Javert and I'm Valjean thing, but he doesn't seem motivated by a desire to get one over on Cisco. He seems committed to the cause of the Maquis. But what about that cause? Eddington tells Cisco repeatedly that the Maquis' fight is with the Cardassians, not the Federation, and that seems to be the case mostly. But Eddington is very willing to attack Federation targets if it suits him. 
And for the uniform, not only does he use that planted virus to disable the Defiant, but he, or a Maquis team under his command at least, also attacks the USS Malinche. And from the way Captain Sanders describes it to Sisko, it sounds like an ambush. The Maquis apparently rigged a Cardassian ship they'd recently attacked and captured to emit false life signs, which led the Malinche to approach with its shields down to beam the wounded to safety. When the Malinche got close enough, a weapon planted aboard the Cardassian ship disabled the Malinche's helm, and three Maquis ships that had been lying in wait nearby flew in to attack. That's not just counterattacking a Starfleet ship that's chasing you in order to get away, that's setting a trap for a Starfleet ship and leaving it for dead. Eddington can still claim that they didn't kill anybody, but he goes beyond that to insist to Sisko that the Maquis isn't a threat to the Federation, and that clearly isn't true. So, how long might it have been before his claim to not be a killer wasn't true either? Also, if Eddington's claim that the Maquis aren't an enemy of the Federation were true, they're still attacking Cardassian outposts, and it seems like those outposts have some civilians hanging around too. If attacking Federation civilians is bad, attacking Cardassian civilians ought to be bad too, right? I know Cardassia is a fascist state, and it's possible, even likely, that the civilians who are present are being used as cover for military operations, but even so, Eddington gets awfully upset at Sisko doing to a Maquis planet, poisoning the atmosphere to render it uninhabitable to its current residents, what Eddington had no problem whatsoever doing to a couple of Cardassian planets. Despite that, there's a strong argument for Eddington as the hero, or at least a hero. It's complicated, and he's certainly not a pure good guy, no matter which way you slice it, but it's there, and I think the producers of the show want us to be able to see it and consider it. Presumably, Eddington sympathizes with the Maquis for the same reason as other Starfleet officers who join their cause, because he sees them as representing a group of mistreated people who have no choice but to fight for what they consider rightfully theirs. In his earlier appearances, we see that Eddington is a dedicated member of Starfleet who cares about his career, but who also has grown attached to his co-workers on Deep Space Nine. He's willing to walk away from all of that to fight with the Maquis. Sisko is angry at Eddington for betraying his oath to Starfleet, but it's not as if doing so didn't cost Eddington anything. It cost him a lot, his career, his way of life. But he chose to pay that price in order to do what he felt was right. He made a difficult choice, a choice that demanded personal sacrifice, and he made it because he wanted to help others. That sounds like a hero to me. The producers of Deep Space Nine obviously thought there was some hero in him because they let him end his stint on the series by going out like a hero. That happens in the fifth season episode, Blaze of Glory. This episode takes place after the Dominion has mostly wiped out the Maquis. General Martok informs Sisko that he has learned a small group of surviving Maquis have launched missiles against Cardassia. The missiles are cloaked and estimated to hit their targets in less than two weeks. Sisko fears that if missiles launched by humans strike Cardassia, it will trigger all-out war with the Dominion, which hasn't happened yet. So, Sisko yanks Eddington out of prison, hoping he can help locate the cloaked missiles before they reach their destination. Eddington doesn't want to help. At first, he tells Sisko, you didn't care when the Dominion slaughtered the Maquis, and... I don't care what happens to you now. Besides, he adds, the missiles are undetectable, so there's nothing he can do to help anyway. That's not good enough for Sisko, who takes Eddington with him aboard a runabout and heads for the Badlands. Along the way, Eddington repeats his assertion that the Maquis were not a threat to the Federation, only the Cardassians. And Sisko's like, well, you're right about that. You were such a threat to the Cardassians that they joined the Dominion. Nice job, dipshit. Shut up. You shut up! After Sisko forces Eddington to help them escape from some Jem'Hadar in order to prove that Eddington's whatever-I-don't-care attitude was a facade, Eddington agrees to take Sisko to the launch site of the missiles. 
From there, hopefully, the missiles can be deactivated before they hit their targets. Eddington flies the runabout to Athos 4, the former Maquis outpost where the missiles had been launched. They find Jem Hadar soldiers already there. After fighting their way past them, they also start to encounter the bodies of dead Maquis. People Eddington knew. That doesn't exactly make Eddington's day. He lapses into a bout of regret and self-pity, saying, It wasn't supposed to go down like this. We were winning our fight against Cardassia. We were going to declare our independence. We would have had a cool flag and a three-day weekend every week. Then it would have been illegal for dentists not to give kids lollipops at the end of appointments. <laughs> as soon as we got dentists. <laughs> Cisco's like, dude, pull it together. Let's stop those missiles first, and then you can cry like Odo when he thought you were taking his job, okay? They fight their way past some more Jem'Hadar, then get to a room where a group of Maquis survivors have barricaded themselves. One of them, Rebecca, is the person who sent the message that Martok intercepted that set this whole wacky missile chase into motion. Rebecca is also Eddington's wife. Eddington's like, all right, everybody, let's go. We've got a runabout and we're all getting out of here. Cisco's like, what about the missiles? And Rebecca says, yeah, we kind of made that part up. There were never any missiles. It turns out the message about the missiles was just code to let Eddington know that some Maquis survivors had made it here to their fallback position and were in need of rescue. Eddington took advantage of the fake missile crisis to get out of jail and come get his people. Cisco's like, I can't believe you, Eddington, of all people, would work with me under false pretenses. But Eddington's like, hey, look on the bright side. No missiles means no Dominion Counter-Strike. No war. At least not until next season. And Cisco says, yeah, you're right. I should look on the bright side. Hey, I know what'll cheer me up. Punch you in face! They make a move for the runabout, but encounter more Jem'Hadar on the way. Eddington and Cisco stay behind so the rest of the group can get away, and Eddington is shot. He insists that Sisko leave him behind and get Rebecca and the others to safety. Sisko's like, there's no way I'm just leaving you here. And Eddington says, just go, I'll only slow you down. And Sisko's like, good point, bye. Sisko, Rebecca, and the others escape. Eddington remains behind, makes a hopeless last stand against the Jem'Hadar, and goes down Scarface style. Ah! I take your disruptor bursts! I take your disruptor bursts! Later, back on Deep Space Nine, Dax says, well, he was a complicated dude, but he definitely went out the way he wanted to, being shot full of holes by merciless lizard men. And Sisko says, you know, I called him a traitor, but actually, he might have been the most loyal person I've ever known. Right to the end, he was a Maquis. Does that mean you feel bad for hunting him down like a rabid dog and poisoning an entire planet in order to capture him? Nah. Good, because that was dope! He dies a hero's death, but is Eddington a hero? I think I agree with both Dax and Sisko. He's complicated, but ultimately, he's loyal. And look who he's loyal to at the very end. Yes, he's loyal to the Maquis, he's loyal to the cause, but the cause is lost, and the Maquis, for all practical purposes, no longer exists. When Eddington risks his life, and ultimately gives his life in Blades of Glory, he does it for his wife and his comrades. He puts himself on the line and pays the ultimate price to help people he cares about, which I do believe is the reason he joined the Maquis in the first place. Is his cause as pure and just as he thinks it is? No. Is he a little full of himself? Does he have delusions of grandeur? Sure. Is he a hero? Yeah, I think he is. A very flawed, complicated hero whose actions compel us to question the assumed goodness and moral superiority of Starfleet and the Federation, which makes him kind of a perfect hero for Deep Space Nine. But back to that cause for which Eddington turns his back on Starfleet and ultimately gives his life, you may have noticed that I didn't really examine that cause too deeply. That's because this video is only the first of a two-part series about the Maquis. This won the patron and member poll to be this month's Regulation Trek Actually topic, and it just so happens 
that I also received a commission from Keith Rautenberg to make a video about whether or not the Maquis were justified in their actions. So this time was about Eddington. Next time is about the Maquis as a whole, their motives, their actions, their cause. Was it just? Was it reasonable? If you saw a member of the Maquis, would you encourage them and tell them they were doing the right thing? Or would you say, You betrayed your uniform! And you're betraying yours! Right you now. shut up! Hey folks, hope you enjoyed this one. I'm going to let you know what the subject of the next Trek Actually video is going to be, but before I do that, I want to give shout outs to some of my newest Patreon patrons and channel members. First, the new patrons. They are Perry Williams, thank you, Perry. Cat Hunter, thank you, Cat. Rick Jana, thank you, Rick. Jamie Weber, thank you, Jamie. Next, I've got one new channel member to shout out this month, Kemp Chalmers, who rejoined as a member last month. Thank you, Kemp. Those are the newest Patreon patrons to pledge $5 a month or more, and the newest channel members to join at the 5 bucks a month tier or higher. If you want to support this channel, you can do so by going to patreon.com slash steveshives and pledging any amount from a dollar a month on up or clicking the join button to become a member of this channel. All patrons and members get access to exclusive posts that allow you to vote in the polls that determine upcoming Trek Actually topics and also submit questions ahead of time for my twice monthly Ask Away live streams. If you pledge five $5 a month or more on Patreon, or become a member at the 5 bucks a month tier or higher, you get a shout out at the end of a Trek Actually video. I could not do this without the support of my patrons and my members. So to all of you who support this channel with a monthly contribution, thank you so much for enabling me to have this wonderful job. Of course, if you want to support this channel with a one-time gift, rather than a recurring monthly contribution, you're always more than welcome to do that through PayPal or Venmo. The links for those are in the video description. And once again, if you want to help out on a regular basis, please go to patreon.com slash Steve Shives or just click the join button below the video. Many thanks. If you like what I do on YouTube, especially the Star Trek related stuff, you should also check out my side projects the Ensign's Log, the Star Trek-themed comedy podcast that I'm on alongside Jason Harding and Dana Cole. The three of us play characters who are low-ranking Starfleet officers. We are about to finish out our fourth season. The season finale drops this Friday. If you're not listening already, the links are in the description of this video. Please do check out the Ensign's Log. I also do a weekly watch-along live stream with Dana called Trek Reluctantly, where we watch episodes of Deep Space Nine, which Dana has never seen before, and another series, or sometimes a movie, that I have never seen before. We're nearly finished season two of Deep Space Nine. On the off weeks from DS9, we're watching the Netflix original animated series, Hilda. So whenever you're able to join us, we invite you to queue up whatever we're watching on your end and watch along with us. It's every Wednesday starting at 6 p.m. Eastern on this channel right here. So if you're interested and able, please join us for Trek Reluctantly. We'd love to have you. Next month's Regulation Trek Actually topic, as chosen by my patrons and members, will take us into some of the spooky and creepy corners of the Star Trek franchise. We'll wander down some dark and scary corridors as we examine the question, is Star Trek actually any good at horror? That's next month. Plus, don't forget the second Maquis video coming next week. I'll see you then. Thanks for watching and take care, everybody.